Yeah, hi, everybody. <clears throat> Looks like the Brady Bunch here. <laughs> um, I want to talk about an event I attended last night online. Um, it was run by the Chester Children's Chorus, which was started 30 years ago by a music teacher who decided to meet with seven um, kids from an underprivileged district, uh, in, in an underprivileged city in Pennsylvania. And um, over the years, it expanded into a wonderful program where they're able to take kids every week to a university and teach them how to sing classical music in harmony. And it, I think it's just a wonderful thing. And then they've expanded it to add a math program. They're going to add uh, language arts. But um, he was presenting some statistics about um, yeah, the gap that exists from <laughs> communities just uh, north or west of this place to to the kid in terms of um yeah the support they get and uh so there's structural problems that um he says if we didn't have if America was supposed to be was the way it's supposed to be these kids would get what they need and they'd have opportunities equivalent to the other areas and uh yeah I found that message hard to take um so uh so that's a dream I'd love to see it expand into other cities I'm sure there are similar things but you see the good ideas need to be surfaced somehow and brought at, you need pilots and the people to run them yep so um i was showing earlier this chord keyboard and for fun <laughs> this is um so sam han has studied a lot about douglas engelbart and he prompted me with the question what would it take to run doug's nls system today and that prompt got my mind thinking in all different directions and doing the research, so what were the benefits of his NLS system? That means online system. It's from his 1968 demo called The Mother of All Demos. You could just search for that on YouTube. And um, that was the first time that computers were being seen as improving productivity and helping uh, the normal person, office worker, uh, yeah, just to get things done better and his whole life was about improving processes and augmenting our intellect and um yes yeah, Sam Han said that at the end of his life he still didn't think we had made enough progress we've made very little progress um towards his goals and maybe it's a, a little bit higher now but still um so what's getting me thinking yeah I've looked at some of the research and um it's possible to go through the code and see it but uh, there's no on well I I don't think there is a way to get access to whatever became of NLS um we're gonna see if Sam could find out more about that but uh taking the concepts forward um Christina Engelbart his daughter is uh, running the Douglas Engelbart Institute and they have a demo called hyperscope where you could play with it and she's still working on expanding that so it's funny how like things were put away brought out put away again brought out so there was like a 2006 project and then this was like 2021 when this latest hyperscope came out so um Sam's got me thinking about functional programming and uh, data log uh, for a uh, database. Uh, so all these things are jumbled in my head. And I just figured I'd check in here, say hello to everybody. And good to see you all. Let me at least oh. say, Eric, I am yes. really enthused by your follow-up on okay. the atomic uh, reference. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've been trying to learn on my own, uh, just exploring different paths, and I'm documenting the paths I'm taking in Workflowy, so we could go through that. But uh, awesome. see, like, I'm wondering, like, would you be more like a mentor for me and guiding me, or it's like on my own, I could go in my own directions and. Uh, but see, like what what I've felt is I've never practically seen the functional programming in action in a real company. Or uh, I mean, I I know it's out there somewhere. I just haven't seen it used the way but I told you. Or you probably come across the new bank story. Right? Yeah, that I read about. Mm -hmm. Right, which I think is already pretty impressive. And oh, it is. Many smaller companies, you know, that are leveraging. Uh, yeah. So we, should we put all our money in Brazil now? <laughs> if they'll take it i probably would <laughs> you know i would trust that infrastructure more than i trust other infrastructure <laughs> probably yeah, yeah you have bricks now exactly. i don't know is, is is brazil waxing gibbous these days <laughs> brazil is at the forefront of adoption of functional technologies particularly around financial services yeah, so we never really got together on how we're going to collaborate or what the scope yeah. is of that. And, yep. yeah, I know you've been busy. Have. You haven't made many of these calls, and I haven't reached out to you. So this is a good opportunity to reconnect. Mm -hmm. All right, let's not bear, uh, let's not bore Barry. Um, but I just want to say that uh, was pretty cool that you followed up on that reference and are learning. And by the way, that video that you sent uh, about Rich Hickey talking about the fundamentals and. Mm -hmm. It's very good. That's probably the third or fourth time I watched it, but I did rewatch it, you know, when he sent that video. Yeah, I mean, it gets me <laughs> thinking about the SQL that we're, we have all over the place. I mean, do you get the fact that, you know, with data immutability, a lot of problems go away? Yeah, I get that. And did um, you get the points you made about locality, you know? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, there's, um, yeah, you see that even instantaneous around the world there's time before the leap year comes or the new year and leap second comes and yeah 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 I, I don't like this word that sometimes applies to these kind of uh databases sometimes the word bitemporal comes up I actually don't like that word I wouldn't uh, but that is a reference to some of these uh, techniques that he's talking about mm -hmm. you know yeah I mean I like that he still preserves transactions yeah. But you have transaction IDs and everything is append only, you know, that's what yep. they call. Yeah. yeah, and the append only is the fundamentals of the distributed decentralized web. And well, Hickey was doing this since uh many years ago. Okay. Right. So why yeah, so is there a datomic for the decentralized web and why not? <laughs> why not? Like he said, yeah. you know, he says he can use anything for the mm -hmm. persistence layer. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So persistence could be on my laptop and uh, serving to whoever connects to me as a peer. Yeah. And everybody else could have a peer and you could have, uh, if you really want to have a service that provides peering, yeah. that people are doing it. Um, do it on Holo, do it on Ethereum, you know, do it on whatever the hot. Right. But you don't even need a blockchain. Right. Yep. Right. For people who care, you know, they can do it that way. Right. But like you said, you can do it on Dynamo. You can do it on, you know, mm -hmm. Postgres. Yep. Okay. I think we've sufficiently bored uh, Barry. <laughs> yeah. How are you doing, Barry? <laughs> Am I doing? Oh, pretty good. I mean, yeah, there's a National Geographic out about the brain. Um, it, they, all the new advances in brain research. It's on newsstands. It's fascinating. Oh. What, what do they uh, highlight? Anything fascinating? Um, I have it. I haven't looked at it much, but um, there are some new techniques. They've really learned more. Um, well, I guess comparing it to neural nets, but also um, the ideas of localization of function that's out the window. It's really coordination of yeah, all these parts. holographic uh, memory seems to be more the model, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I guess so. Um, yeah, it's fascinating to ponder but <laughs> we live in fascinating times i mean i look at what's going on there i look at what's going on in computing you know especially with quantum computing oh yeah what's going on with jwst and all the stuff we're learning there mm -hmm. about the disappearance now it's essentially going to get obliterated this whole big bang theory thing you mm -hmm. know there's no <laughs> we've been saying for years now big bang is so inconsistent with a lot of our observations 
Yeah, well, even Hawking reversed himself on his uh, graduate paper. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and even whether or not we can actually see anything around a black hole. Now, obviously, we have Hawking radiation, and you know we can see some of that. Mm -hmm. It's just fascinating. Uh, but like, say I just choose not to pay attention to a lot of stuff that I know is BS, and I just focus on what I enjoy, what I want to read, and yeah. yeah. So I build my own, yeah, little <laughs> this little uh, what do you call? <laughs> I don't know the word, but <laughs> your world, just, your uh, man, yeah. yeah yeah, yeah you're Melvin and Hobbes world, the uh, right world. So if you're interested in sort of the fantasy fiction, then AI is your friend. If you're interested in ground truth of science, then AI is not yet your friend. <laughs> it could be, it could be but it isn't yet. But see, here's 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 a potential problem: is that if we each decide to pursue our own interests, and it's not evident how that benefits society or benefits the greater good then at some point there will be some AI that says, that person's a waste of energy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not a, that's not a hard conclusion to imagine. Well, is that the right. matrix? Yeah, they're not a net contributor to the welfare of the planet and the race and, and no. whatever. But who's making those decisions about, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, people, a lot of people are very judgmental just by nature. It's very hard to be non-judgmental. It's considered to be a virtue to be non-judgmental, but it's not an easy virtue to achieve. Any ability to do if then is a discrimination of a sort. And yeah. if you take that to an extreme, then that's judgment. Yeah. Is there yeah. any language that has fewer ambiguities? I believe Esperanto was a designed language, but I don't know it. So I don't know if it's more precise. Yeah. Now, yeah. we sent records on Voyager 1 and 2, and we tried to teach on the records a primer of our mathematics so they could find out where we are and using binary and the hydrogen atom spin as a unit of time. Yeah. 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 So having, it, mm -hmm. yeah, having a message that only has one consistent interpretation, and that's not easy to do in English. It puns and and multiple interpretations are so commonplace in spoken language, mm -hmm. especially English. I think other languages maybe don't have as big a problem as English with its importation of words from so many other languages and cultures. And so such a rich use of metaphors and, and uh, poetic terms. You know, it's so. hard enough given a language framework or backdrop or understanding to form a well-formed statement but yeah, well -formed it's form. harder even in this case that uh, eric talks about where you don't have such a language framework and you're sending an artifact and you're expecting some intelligent entity to basically infer the language structure and the language framework and then to uh, you know ascribe meaning to what that yeah. artifact is trying to convey and they That's have a lot of work double problem do. Yeah, they have a you lot see, of work to do to do to yes. get to the message. You see a lot of that. Headlines. He may have done a lousy job, although Carl Sagan well, is a brilliant guy. Yeah, you know? he did a good job, but he was rushed. Like yeah. so, you see a lot of that in headlines, where the part of speech of word in a headline isn't obvious, whether it's a verb or a noun or an adjective, or how to you know how to diagram the the, the sentence or the. Often or that's intentional. They want to go for puns too in these. Yeah, things. and and I look at headlines, and after I read the article, oh, it's not what I thought the headline was saying. It's yeah, kind of parts it in a different way. It's so can, can an LLM help here to bridge gaps between individuals and messages? If you tell an LLM, I want a, a phrase that doesn't have ambiguous multiple meanings. Mm -hmm. It can probably limit the likelihood that a word or a phrase or sentence has multiple uh, plausible meanings. You know, that's actually one way you, I, apply a heuristic to some text to see if an LLM pr uh, produced it or not. Because if it's very precise about its pronoun references, about, you know, how it sequences statements and whatever, humans are not necessarily very good at that. They're terrible at it. Right. So if that is done well, more likely than not, it's done by some LLM, yeah. in my opinion. 
So I'm wondering as an intermediary for communication, like say I want to ask the LM, how do I explain this to a seven-year-old? And it gives me something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the the every word is is well known in a general vocabulary and doesn't have so many possible definitions that you're not sure what the person was saying. Yeah. yeah. Or you can and, preface it as using a fifth grade reading level, blah. <laughs> yep. Using a college level reading level, yeah. blah. Right. Yeah. And for me to understand what seven year olds are saying these days. <laughs> yeah. I am very enthused to uh, see if we can collaborate on a personal project regarding functional projects, functional approaches, datonic, mm -hmm. you know, that would be awesome. I've got like six different projects I've been holding off for about 15 years because I said, I'm too busy with my work. Well, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, you know, doing other things now. So, well, do you have like a, a simple starter project for learning datomic as you go and setting I'm, something up? The uh, simplest possible one is a classic, you know, just an action item tracker. You know, I want to basically start with something like that. What kind of tracker? An action item. An action item. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, although huge. the way I want to do it is with a protocol that's extensible. So mm -hmm. that you can then have a chronology and an event uh, log uh, that can be attached to any other object. Okay. So in other words, you could take a, an object from, let's say, Microsoft Teams or Zoom record or, uh, you know, any calendar project, okay, and bring it in so that you can join it with this uh, event processing thing. And because I want to do it in Datomic, I don't care about the schema. Mm -hmm. okay? The schema is yeah. flexible. Build your own schema as exactly. you go. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So it's ex ultimately extensible and use that as kind of a negotiation platform. Yeah. So like, um, another project I'm working on, which I see the value of using something like Datomic would be like tracking veterans. So like in a, in a cemetery and uh, where, what service, what wars were they in? What medals did they earn? And uh, even in their names, they could have uh, nicknames and uh so and sometimes you don't know the dates of birth or, or it, maybe you have like a, yeah just the years so so yeah an incomplete data trying to track it all but fill it in over time as you get more information yeah yeah so this is more like what is it what do we what do we want from collaborology between us exactly. yeah well you could but even on the uh, whole Doug Engelbart program for the future GCC set of projects. There's already six or seven there that I've been very open about. Yeah. So we can, we can discuss those. Yes. Yeah, so like your original idea was, can we run NLS today? But so if we can get access, we probably can, but uh, who knows about getting access? Yeah, and that's, and, that's some dependency that right now, yeah. you can tell from me, I'm not very optimistic about being able to unblock that. Right, but what I want to ask you is, uh, if you had an NLS system, yeah, what would you want that's modern versus what you had in '68? Like, see, Doug had his own language for moving blocks, moving statements, plexes. Do you still? I mean, you, workflowy is pretty much a lot of that. But what are you missing that Doug had ideas about? Uh, view specs is missing. Okay, uh, in modern, yeah, yeah, right. And very flexible, almost arbitrarily flexible navigation, mm -hmm. which Doug had. Because they start from this plex, go to the nth thing, go to the reference carried by the fourth word, and then come right. to that thing, you know. So mm -hmm. you could actually string together navigation directives in NLS, which no system today, I believe, does. Okay. So like they added these purple numbers. With yeah, that's just one, like one a very that, good step, but it's 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 a step. Yes, it's a good step. Yeah, but you could reference uh, right. a section that's by the, number. That's a necessary yeah. anchor, you know, that you mm -hmm. need for everything else. Yeah. Right. And there is a permanent number as well that you could reference. If, Semi permanent. Yeah. It's only as good as the dot com, oh. the IP, you know. <laughs> Well, yeah, see, now there's where the decentralized web could yes. help because you have right. a permanent address. That's right. So, in fact, if we really cared about that, maybe have you looked into IPFS and how, how good that is? Um, I've very fundamental understanding of it. Um, 
I've more been more on the DAT stack, but I could easily go look into it more. Yeah, I'm not as you know. I, I'm not as confident that that's the solution. Not as confident yeah. as I am. Like for example, Datomic is a good solution. Mm -hmm. I'm very confident on that. But as far as the permanent understructure infrastructure, I'm not sure if it's IPFS. I'm not sure if it's you know some decentralized uh, Ethereum or Holochain or whatever. Else. Yeah, it seems like we always have to build our own tools. <laughs> Nothing is ever good for, good enough for us. <laughs> Well, at the very basic, you know, you kind of rely on DNS, right? And DNS has no right. guarantee of permanence. Right. But you, you don't even need DNS with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networks right. now. But then you see you need some redundancy and some ability to figure yeah. out what's authoritative. Yeah, you want to reference uh, links. So like what you were describing earlier, you could store URLs to everything you're trying to link together right now. And... Uh, yeah. So, but uh, then, what does that give you? You yep. still have to jump between them, and things can disappear. And uh, yep. yep. Okay. So, yes, yeah, save every web page you visit somewhere and <laughs> reference it locally. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> what would be good questions to ask a candidate? Mm -hmm. well, well, before I, you I, read I, them, I, I want to comment before reading them that, okay. in general, I'd want to understand the candidates um it, their the, the historical background of the united states like what is the united states as different from anyone else and uh just um the the fundamental principles that, like how do they view the constitution these days is it uh, so are these principles still in our, our collective consciousness first one do you agree there is too much systemic racism throughout police forces in this country two do you agree the ultra rich ought to pay more taxes three you think a felon should be able to run for any government office let alone the presidency four do you agree there ought to be universal health care as is offered in most other countries next should churches be taxed if they take and encourage political positions next can you unblock the trials of Trump charges actively being delayed by Trump appointees? Next, do you support abolition of the Electoral College? Next, how will you restore honesty, integrity, transparency, accountability in the Fourth Estate? Next, how will you work to repeal Citizens United? Next, do you believe women can take responsibility for their own bodies? Next. Will you work to impeach and remove corrupt and unethical Supreme Court justices? Next, will you protect Social Security funds from being siphoned off for other purposes? Next, will you be transparent on your tax returns? Next, do you believe in a scientific method, critical thinking, evidence and logic based decision making? Next, will you hold yourself accountable to a code of ethics or conduct? Ah, there it is, Barry. Will you hold yourself accountable to a code of ethics or conduct? If yes, how will you do so? And if not, why not? Next, did Trump instigate the 1 6, Ned January 6 insurrection? Next, are you going to let religion or any church influence your actions if you attain the office? That's my list of questions. One thing that I would add is um, should the 17th Amendment be repealed? And that uh, would remind be... me what that one is. Okay, that's. Um... The Senate used to be appointed by the state legislatures, but uh, they made it into um, where we vote for senators. And um, just going back to the structure of the country, the House is meant to be the people's representative and the states are meant to be represented in the Senate. And now if you can you trust the judgment of the people or should it be more of a state function? Like what's been the impact of that since it passed? <laughs> you, you mean going back to letting elected officials of the state appoint their senators as opposed to voting for them? Is that what you're right. saying? Right, yes. Okay, it never occurred to me that that was even something that people thought was a reasonable yeah. idea. Mm -hmm. it going, going away from democracy and back to, um, second order representation the representatives elect the next level of representatives it's sort of like appointment and some yeah okay i get it 
I yeah, guess. it's just uh, like going back to the fundamental principles of what the role is, because these are these senators, they're doing treaties. And uh, I think the, the roles have been mutated since. So that, that's my theory there. I think the issue there that you're referring to is this one about small groups of people in outlying counties and states having undue influence and power compared to dense population centers. I think that's how I read it. Okay, yeah, there was that original compromise uh, where the small states felt they wouldn't have representation if it was just by population, and that's why the Senate was yeah. just two, two per state. Asking a candidate, how can you assure the electorate that you are competent at ethical reasoning uh, and therefore can arrive at um, justifiable ethical uh, determinate dis discernment and adhere to it. So basically, if they suck at ethics, they won't be able to answer that in a way that's um, convincing. And if they are, they'll actually spell out, here's how I do my ethical reasoning, and here's you know, why you should believe that I can not only do it, but adhere to it. So I think it's sort of at the meta level. See, journalists were supposed to be that fourth branch of government to, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so, yes, in terms of that, that the journalists who are asking the questions are asking it on our behalf. That's the kind of question I would like a uh, a journalist to ask in a debate, for example, or just in an, uh, any kind of an occasion where they're talking to a candidate, interview or something. Right. Go ahead, Sam. I, years ago, posted on Facebook that any time we had a press conference, that every journalist, in fact, every attendee, ought to bring their own self-made uh, sign, okay? And it would say, no, that's a lie on one side. <laughs> and the other side would say, yes, that is verified, okay? Because there's no chance really to have anyone say, oh, by the way, you know, that's not correct. You know, I have to correct you for the record on this. But if everybody was able to just hold up their sign and say, that's a bleeping lie, okay? Exactly, thumbs up, thumbs down, okay? Then at least a camera pan could show, yeah, most of the people just think you're full of bullshit. I so if, every, if everyone was using NLS these days, would we be able to have these discussions? Yes, or, I think so. Yeah. Because we could then, you know, say this is a supporting, uh, this is a contradictory, mm -hmm. you know, and then do analytics on those kind of things and follow up. And the analytics are not so important uh, for truth, but they're important for analysis, for follow up. Yeah, I think you have to have the provenance of people's yes, work. Exactly. Opinions. Exactly. Yeah. So you can see why somebody said something, mm -hmm. which is really important. Yeah, and linked to their that, biography. Where did they exactly. grow up? Who did they where did they go to that's school? Right. And yeah, so you know that's who right. you're talking about. Yeah, that's that's really key because I see so many times in journalism, people say, I can't tell the truth. This person said that, that person said this. What? You can't understand reasoning. You can't understand how you follow that you know particular path of thought to get to this versus that. Yeah. And you can see, well, that one's very well substantiated. And this, oh, that's just you know from uh, Alex Breitbart or whatever. Or but whatever you have to, is. you also have to look at it in terms of the art of persuasion. How people are trying to persuade others to their viewpoint. I've got a cat on my keyboard. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> it's writing a novel, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love oh. this guy. This is like a oh. like twenty-six pound uh, tatami. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, yesterday I saw one of these YouTube shorts on the world's largest cat species. Mm -hmm. Man, some of them get to be thirty whatever pounds. I thought this was a big cat already at twenty-six pounds. Yeah, some of them are lions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but anyway, this one may have parts of Maine Coon. Yeah, see, I'm also wondering how effective would she be at getting her message out? Like, maybe it would RFK notice her, and does she need like a hundred thousand Facebook followers for him to take notice or something like that? <laughs> it's a question of getting your voice heard these days. <laughs> yeah, I don't know those statistics. Mm -hmm. Eric, yeah. please do uh, move on to whatever it is you wanted to bring up. Okay, I'm going to share my desktop and flip over to um, 
Okay, I wanted to show Hyperscope, what they have online now, and uh, some of the features you could play with now. So like here is Doug's article, and you can take out the blank lines if you want more real estate, you can turn yep. off the purple numbers. And um, when you um, go into an X, you can expand the level. So B gives you one more level. Yep. So Okay, so these are view specs essentially, and they're codified up here. Now, see what I like about this is uh, this is a light mode. And then when you get comfortable with that, you do a light plus and you get some more features you could play with. Now, one thing that really frustrates me these days is hitting a key and having the computer do something and I don't know what it did and I don't know how to undo it. So, see, I think. One theory that Doug may have had is that users should have the training in the fundamentals, and then it, if they hit a wrong key, it should do nothing. And then when they learn the next step, then you get access to the new features and you, you're you trained on them. So you know that, okay, I have another button that will do something because the websites today, it's insane what you, the user interfaces and what they do behind the scenes of these hovering uh, spell checking and grammar and changing your text on the fly and then you send an email and uh, it's not what you intended <laughs> so that, i just wanted to point that out so these are the modes they have they have a max which gives you all these features of nls and uh, expert you could turn off and try just using the keys yourself and there's a developer mode yeah so there's some extra features for developers for testing here so you there's a handful of documents you could use this on now to explore and play with so like this view here of seeing the first line of every paragraph um, it's like a, a good summary, I think, um, and seeing more of the structure. And then um, you could go to the table of contents view and jump to something that looks interesting to you. And then, I mean, I, I, I'm not really using this much, but it, it's something to be familiar with. Okay. Now, um, looking at our workflowy, I've collapsed it up to here. So this is what we started with in April. Mm -hmm. And the high level topics are initial thoughts and notes. Where do we start questions, education, and useful references? That's what it's evolved into. Mm -hmm. And I've started putting in some references, uh, the books, uh, the oral history, and my education paths. So here's what I've put in for my education so we could yeah, if anyone wants to see what I'm doing. Hey, you haven't found the uh, book where I've got a chapter yet. Oh, I know about that one. I just haven't put it in here. I've seen that before. Yeah. Um, questions. We could look at some of these. Uh, where do we start? We could delve into the, let's see, the initial thoughts. Um, yeah, these are old thoughts. We're thinking about connecting with Eugene Eric Kim. Um, I don't know if this uh, YouTube from the 7th of April was ever published. Yeah, uh, you still have it. I haven't done yet. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Okay, now let me just see where right, we... Just a quick note on that one. I did try with this infra notice tool that I yeah. found, but mm -hmm. it requires a subscription and I've actually paid it, but then I can't figure out how to use it. So yeah, I that's put together with their tech support and figure out how to do this. Right. <laughs> Okay, now let's see what we were thinking of. Where do we start? Well, there's ongoing research of previous NLS ML systems experiments. See, I've been experimenting. I got my uh, little keyboard key set working. All right. Uh, yeah, that it works with the org term. Have you so, learned the uh, the chords for all the letters? Yeah, I'm uh, getting better at it because I'm actually practicing with Barry's mud. Like navigating with the key set. <laughs> awesome. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, we were thinking about desire mints. Let's just see what we got here. Uh, yeah, I want to understand the speed that Doug had. We want strict separation of data. Uh, NLS style terminal editing with user determined commit points like Git rebasing. What was I thinking? <laughs> uh, let's see. Pull requests, uh, decentralized web. 
feature is not available today. So like you mentioned view specs, do we have more under that? Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just making highlights from uh, some documents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, hey, Eric, while well, you're yeah. going through this, can you see how if each of these nodes was one of the triples in Datomic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how that could be then you know constructed and uh, we would have just ultimate power over what was being done here. I just yeah, your link uh, uh yeah go connection. yes, you're uh, expanding and collapsing. Yeah, so this expands, and this is a reference to computerhistory.org, and another yeah. Yeah, just some, I think those are both from that article. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, workflow is nice. Uh, the, 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 yeah, because it's a modern interface to what Doug envisioned, sort of. Yes. Okay. Yeah, does adding functionality to org term, we could always do that whenever we want. Mm -hmm. um, we never got to documentation about our collaboration. I have your nine artifacts. We never did a CCC, your COI. So like, what would be the benefit of us doing a CCC? We could then see what we intend to do together mm -hmm. as individual statements. And then we would set up expectations, which hopefully will prevent or minimize disappointment later down the line. Right. So, yeah, I mean, uh, for me, finding time for projects, uh, it's tricky, uh, work and uh, other social things. And But uh, I think um, I've got a handle on work right now. Um, I, like we're progressing forward. And uh, so, um, see, I'm not retired where I could just do this full time. Maybe one day I will be. But, uh, I hope to be soon. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Barry, how's retirement? Is it worth it? Uh, oddly <laughs> enough, I can't find enough things to fill up my time that are still within like to learn the closer. energy <laughs> and kind of to faculties. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> In other okay. words, a, there are periods of boredom and loneliness where there's not enough to do that's doable <laughs> and worth doing. Yeah, Eric, can I give you tasking? <laughs> well, I said to Anne Marie that she she could offload some thinking tasks that are still within my bailiwick, not too taxing and and not too urgent. Um, <laughs> but but it's but my sphere of functionality is shrinking <laughs> mm. and my energy levels and motivations levels are shrinking too. So it's mm. getting harder and harder to find worthwhile things that are worth doing. I have energy and, and uh, interest to do. Okay. And the other thing we mentioned was a COI practices of self and peer accountability community of impact. Have yeah, I so given like you a, that link? Um, I'm it's sure not, I could it's communityofimpact.info. It. I should have put that in here. Okay, let me go there. Let's see, is it still up? I hope it's still up. <laughs> yes, it is. is. Okay. So deciding to commit to be good. Okay. Being explicit, transparent about what we want to accomplish, accountability, yep, retrospectives, and you have your CCCs, align your good and their good, okay, that's it, and you have some comments, yep, <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so like, we could like think about things we could do together and help each other but then if there's someone else who eventually comes in yeah think about that <laughs> yeah so so two peers so i'm accountable to barry and sam right <laughs> sam's busy for a minute i was uh muting while amazon was talking to me uh, oh was, uh, okay so okay yeah, basically, this is a self-identifying, self-opt-in identification of alignment with these principles, okay? Right. And if you hold yourself accountable to these principles, 
you declare yourself, hey, I'm a member of the COI because I do this for myself and I'm holding myself accountable with a couple of people. That part mm -hmm. is the difficult part because right. uh, finding two people who want to do this and who are mm -hmm. willing to be very, very candid and say, hey, Sam, you know, you know, the three bucks you gave to this person over there, you know, how come it wasn't five? You know, that's sort of that's mm -hmm. that kind of question. Yep. And see, one thing like um, I don't want to be beholden to any like financial interest sponsoring anything and uh, or like an academic institution where this is being done. Uh, like, let's see, it's like I, I want to be independent and uh, like contribute as I see fit or I'm able to do without um, like having investors or or anything like that. <laughs> yeah yeah i'm very uh, leery of the uh, uh -huh. the bad influences of money oh yeah follow the money <laughs> yeah but that's how things get done in the world <laughs> it's today. crazy well, yeah but today yes. right right okay so yeah so like uh i was listening to an interesting podcast uh is Sam's yeah okay is it it's Sam Chan oh Sam Chan welcome it's yeah. not on video yet I'm just blowing my nose okay okay yeah. sure yeah I'm gonna just stop sharing for a minute yeah. Yeah. give Sam Chan a chance to get oriented here sure yep in the middle of a deep thingy <laughs> yeah hi Sam hello hi Abby. hi hi Sam hi Barry good to see you again we didn't see you yesterday yeah Busy running around. I still have running. You blew my nose. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> well, do you That's want to okay. orient? You want to orient Sam before we resume? Well, first, how are you doing, Sam? Busy. Lots of, I guess, uh, situation that demand my attention and demand my present and demand my compassion and I'm grateful that I have those opportunity. Yeah, the most severe one, I guess the most is a older lady, 88 years old, part of the pancreas cancer late stage aggressive in hospice care. She might probably go by the end of the month or something along that line. So I don't know how to deal with that. I'm learning as I go. <laughs> Who is this? It's uh, my employee. One of my employees over. She's been working for me for over 20 years and don't have a lot of relatives in the neighborhood. So I'm sort of the big brother figure <laughs> for her. <laughs> people that need me and all that stuff. So found out about two weeks ago that mom had some discomfort and turned out to be pancreas cancer, late stage, mm -hmm. aggressive. That goes pretty fast. Yeah, it goes pretty fast. So it's, and she refused having treatment and, uh, which is a good thing. I mean, look, you can go suffer and go to chemo and, and this, the chance of, recovering is less than 2% or something on that line. And it's pretty bad. It's just, you know, yeah. the food is not even passing through the, mm. it, it, I call it a plumbing stuck. Yeah. So I have to put a tube in the stomach to let, to, 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 to allow the liquid to come out. <laughs> so it's like, okay, but she looks great. I mean, it's, she's happy and so I'm, Slowly to introduce her to Buddhism and chanting and sutra and all that stuff. So and she's accepting it slowly and because she's from China, right? So basically is they don't believe in religion thing. So, so you want to convince someone that don't believe in religion to have religion, introducing them to them is so it's like gradually. So I always remind myself, it's like walking on up the stairs. One step at a time, you pay full attention to the next step you're about to take, not the one before you. <laughs> hmm. So like, would she believe in an afterlife? Yeah, but it's a traditional Chinese way, which is the, you know, 
you go to heaven or hell or depend on who to do then there's a judge in the hell in hell waiting for you to punish you whatever bad thing you did Wait, that's <laughs> traditional chinese say again sorry is that traditional chinese oh yeah big deal big time if you if you interview a thousand of them 995 will tell you that yeah traditional chinese so they believe in God in heaven, God in the sky, we call the heaven, and there's God in the ground, which is the ground, hell, down, and then God. all the heroes in the historical figure become God somehow, deity or whatever you call that, yeah. And then a lot of uh, Taoism mixed into the Buddhism. They believe whatever they believe that allow them to survive, allow them to get being killed by the emperor and the people in power and bo big bullies around in the town and yeah <laughs> it's complicated it's a long story yeah. but the essentially is is not in the you know as i say the religion in the western and the eastern is very different so for me like a church is a community that care for people that you have compassion for people you it's a community that help each other so we all chip in and help each other so that's a that's a church in 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 <laughs> in the east you're not allowed to do that because when you form a church then you try you have political power you can you might fight a leader in the in the thing so you're not allowed to have a church so see can you imagine a structure of a society that you're not allowed to have a church not allowed to have people to gathering that's why yeah. the fallen gong was uh, persecuted right yeah i mean Today, even have some country like that, you're not allowed to have more than three people gathering, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can know, you can ask Chad GDP how many countries are there, are, are, are there that you're not allowed to have more than three people gathering. And we experienced that during COVID. <laughs> right of assembly is right there in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. Assembly. Yeah. So anyway, so it's, it's, it's different. And the, the other thing that also is that in the Eastern world, uh, because the way that it works is that if you are, if you lost the battle, you become the prisoner and you get killed. And therefore, you know, <laughs> I cannot say too much because it's in the recording mode, right? The bottom line is that if you know you're going to get killed, if you lost the battle, you, 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 you are more aggressive, you are more brutal, and you're more uh, whatever you call it. You you give everything you got to make sure the other person is dead. Think over that kind of uh, mentality. It's no longer that okay. It's your turn to become the king for four years, and I next thing will be my son's turn to and so we can't rotate between our family. It doesn't work that way. When my family lost, my whole family get wiped out. So if you think of that structure, where are you going to find peace? I mean, in some way, it's almost like Israel in Palestine right now. It's like, I want to make sure you have no more military power. I want to make sure this. And it's, it's yeah, it's it's messy when you don't have like, okay, I'll, I, I'm, it's like the best example is like, you know how the Iran did something and then the escalate I mean, that's the best way to dissolve a war, you know, de-escalate. And, and think about the de-escalation that we just saw not too long ago. What does it take for two parties to de-escalate? About saving face, about losing face, about you got a political power you have to hold on to, you got to, <laughs> all that. Like, unless you know, everything has to go perfectly in anything that goes wrong, the escalation just got blown out. And there's a strong third party influence as well. You got it. And a lot of hidden agenda behind it, the escalation, all that dynamic. Yeah, right. So again, it's, and, and if you, why is it, if you trigger down to the very bottom between my family and your family and my neighbor and your neighbors and your power and my power, so all that down to the micro level. Now, can we understand how that belief system evolved? that it's your whole family impacted by like is that from years ago from the dynasties or 
Yeah, yeah. The, if I want to explain about this it's pretty straightforward. You know, when when two emperors are fighting each other, they take away all your food. They take away all the the best example was I was saying like you know how we say that in US we say we line up and to get on the bus even though there's we have to wait for the next bus. Mm -hmm. In China, if you do let other people go in front of you, you never go home. Or like crossing the street with the, so much traffic that if you would allow the traffic to pass through you or allow the car to pass in front of you, you never go home. So mm -hmm. in the structure of the Chinese or some countries in that way is that when the when the ruler take away all your food and take away all your livelihood, you got nothing to do and then you need to protect your family, you need to feed your family compared to the neighbors. So when they have a chance, they have their power, they'll take all your thing away because even they take away everything that you have, that's not enough for them to feed their family. So it's major survival mode in paranoia. Wow. <laughs> so how do you, as a father, you have three kids, and they need to eat, they haven't eaten for two months. And now you have the opportunity to have a knife that the other neighbor doesn't have a knife in you. What are you gonna do? I mean, so that's how it become that. Oh, mm -hmm. nothing, you know, violence in paranoid mode. Yeah. It's, yeah. Now see I mean, someone like me, I've never heard this before. I've yeah. never heard this type of belief system or religion. And uh so yeah, like how would I relate to somebody who grew up like this? Yeah. The same thing you're going through. Yeah. So think of this way again. It's like sort of your entire family had no food for, for a month. Mm -hmm. And now you have a gun, a machine gun in your hand. And the whole neighborhood, everybody have enough food to last half a day. What would you do? Yeah. But for your friend, in these last whatever time she has, does this belief system serve her? Or can she adapt to something like Buddhism? Yeah, it's 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 hard because you you want to change somebody's belief is because it's like let me give you an idea like my grandma like best way you can explain it, my grandma when she left China was she was eighteen years old that's after all her brothers got killed all her brother like I think three or four of them get killed murdered by the you know in the nineteen hundred okay in China get all killed. And her father say, here, this is a, a dollar coin, okay? Go get married with this guy, we, he was an orphan. <laughs> it's like, and I, okay, he's a young man, he can take you to, to, to Asia. Okay, go walk for a month, you know, to the, to the side, o o ocean side, so you can get a boat and you, they'll pay, you pay them to, to get you. And when she arrived in Malaysia for 70 years, she was so afraid to go home to, to China. It takes me 10 years to convince her. <laughs> it's safe to go there. They don't do that anymore, blah, 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 and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. then, then I have to say to her that, and then she had this belief that when she dies, she wants to come back to Malaysia to get buried because when she was at 70 years old, she already bought the coffin and bought the lamp mm -hmm. for a grave and all that stuff because she think that, uh, kids and all that may not be able to afford the funeral for her. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I say to her, if I if she die in the US when I bring her here, I'll put her in the gunny bag and send her back, bring her back with me. And then she was convinced that so she's willing to go to get the passport to the embassy. And then she came here and spent nine months with me. She was afraid to go back to China because all the history have, I mean, can you imagine a young child growing up and all the brother get killed in front of you? Mm. Would you go back to that place? How do you convince them? It takes 10 years. Yeah, well, trauma lasts generations. Oh, yep. uh, yep. yeah. Yep. And that's how the power people in power gain power. And they don't realize that that's what I mean by power abuse. So it's like, okay, when you have power, you have a tendency to abuse because you, you know, mm -hmm. you're blindsided than, you know, anything that you need to be paid attention to. So it's hard. Survival is the only thing that keeps us wise. <laughs> Unless you're. Yeah, I guess just see what would give her peace in her last days. Uh, yeah. What can you yeah. do to help her through this? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um... You know, it's, it's just a lot of times it's sort of like you reassure her, you this and you give evidence. 
so I'm, it's a good thing that I learned NLP, right? So you 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 bring you know you learn to bring the good things. You talk about good things and anchor them with the good things, and then mm -hmm. hopefully the bad thing didn't trigger and sort of like make a pot of soup that's so yummy that you don't make sure that the fry doesn't fall into it or something like that. <laughs> you destroy the whole thing. So it's it's complicated. It take a lot of compassion, a lot of patience, a lot of energy, a lot of. Uh, history and respect and i learned still not enough learning i i took a class on hospice care believe it or mm -hmm. not <laughs> yeah, good. we all go through this um i had a friend who passed away at 75 and i was running to him in the hospital bringing him stuff that he wanted yeah and in the end he just wanted uh to like have a meal with me uh, like a shabbat meal and to remember his the good things that he enjoyed about that yeah 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 talk about shabbat i i'm i'm a, one of our mastermind that we have was for the day that of the shabbat day right mm -hmm. so i said okay so we were in the buddhist temple i said well we'll have a shabbat in the buddhist temple why not yeah <laughs> and, and you see for you you were fine with it but it takes me some convincing does it anything happened it will be on on my <laughs> shoulder. I say yes. I take full responsibility for something bad happened. Yeah, someone drinks too much wine right. in, the, in, the, in the Buddhist temple. <laughs> yeah. How many people you think of that that would say that have a Shabbat in Buddhist temple? You know? Why? Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's like I think there are friends up there. You know, there are mm. friends in you know, the God and 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 Jesus. I have to tell you a good joke about Buddhism and interfaith sure. and all that. There was some, uh, there was a story about this guy was trying to do skydiving. It takes his friend about a month to convince him that skydiving is safe. So he's asked my question, what if the parachute doesn't open, right? They say, well, you have a spare one, don't worry. Or we carefully check and make sure that it's open and all that stuff. So if, if the spare one doesn't open, what do you do? Say, so, well, that will really never never happen i say okay fine i convince him and then he, he jumped after the so many seconds he young the, the main parachute it didn't yeah. open just stuck and then and after my second he looked at was that's the secondary one didn't open us all, all that then then he said oh that's his time i'm a buddhist i'll say Buddha, please help me. So the Buddha appeared in the sky and then put the hand underneath him. As soon as he landed on the palm of the Buddha, you know what he say? What? Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite jokes in interface gathering. We always have a joke, I always have fun with it. Yeah, it's like uh, following a logical syllogism to its conclusion. <laughs> so, so I yeah. hope you have fun with it. Yeah, you can't have God and Buddha. <laughs> G ampersand <Yeah>. not D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of times, you know, in a sad discussion, all that stuff. You know, I always bring joke and fun to so diffuse the because. Yep. This is all life about. Mm -hmm. You know, I count how it's not how many times how many breaths you take, it's about how many times I catch your breath. Yeah, it's about connection. Yeah, go ahead, Sam. I don't think you were here, Sam, uh, maybe a week or two or three ago, but in one of those past sessions, the question I asked was. There's so much war going on. There's so many war wars being waged. Do we know what it means to wage peace? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to understand, you know, to me, there's many elements that have to interconnect and have to be evolved for that to happen. If you in insist on nonviolence, it doesn't come without justice. If you want justice, it doesn't come without education. If you want education, it doesn't come without, you know, values and without uh, care, without uh, mentoring. So there's a whole complex infrastructure of society 
that must evolve before we know how to wage peace. And I was curious about that. I think we had about an hour on that in the previous session. But that's what your story reminds me of, Sam. Over. Thank you. Um, this is a big subject. I always come down to the, the difference and make a difference. So for me, what is you're explaining this and remind me about what we talk about is this, this, this. You know, I call it grieving process. So it's like you have something that you have that was so good, and then all of a sudden you lost it. It could be whatever it is that is, it could be a phone, it could be a book, it could be anything at all, even your health, <laughs> your car, you know. You will only grieve for it after you lose whatever that it was ready to you, and you cannot find a replacement for that. Friendship, it could be as well. So unless, until you lost it, you will not be able to appreciate it as much as you know anything else you need. So it could be a good meal, it could be a good food, it could be a good restaurant, it could be a good chef, anything that is. So until you lose it, so peace, how could you lose peace? You, until you lose peace, so in other words, another way of saying is that you have to take someone that's in a peaceful country, put it into a war zone, let them live there for three months, and then you bring them back to the peace zone, then you will appreciate peace. I mean, the, I, I don't know how to explain it, but essentially this is all come down to until someone lose something, they won't really fully appreciate it. It's like my wife, you know, doing laundry for me. And when she's not around, I, I have no laundry. It's like, okay. Honey, I, but for me it was laundry was in the background. I I don't see it. I I, I don't I don't know. I, I I lost until I lost it. <laughs> you know, something along the same line. So the question is, how do you create a structure? How do you create a situation where someone would lose the peace they had, and then now they would appreciate peace, and then they of course once you have, then they will fight for peace and all that stuff. This is another joke that we talk about in the UI. You fight for peace, you know. <laughs> Unless you fight for you won't have peace. So like, okay, fine. So again, it's about how do you have a grieving, whatever that you need to grieve for before you can be something that's important to you, that you want it. But we all have lived through some of these periods. If the world has not been devoid of war for almost any amount of time but, but it doesn't affect you though it does not affect you you, you still have what you have you. again that's what i'm saying to you you have to take someone from the peaceful world put them in gaza let them <clears> live or like i like nothing i would love to have nothing i would live in the gaza for three weeks or something like that if that would be a magic one i would love to have like boom <laughs> nothing i would live in the gaza for three weeks and the and the head of uh you know, whatever is like, you I call it switch places, right? So let the let the emperor become the, the servant, the servant become the emperor for, for three months or something along that line perspective. Until you can create the experience, they won't be longing for it. They, they won't fight for it. They won't, you know. I think that's an extreme case. I think there's most people who, even though they don't live in Gaza they understand already that there's atrocities going on there you know and you don't have understanding is let, let me put it say when's the last time that you you fight for something that like your life depend on it what was the last time that happened to you meaning you're willing to sacrifice meaning that you're willing to give up whatever if you need to give up so that you can have what you have for me it's very simple it's my wife when she was sick what's in you know 30 plus years ago, she was in a Stanford hospital for six and a half months. I would give her anything. I, I would sell everything I own so that she, I can have her health back. So would you do you have experience that, you know, in that it put you in that situation? And then if you reverse engineering back to what causes that, it must be something that for you that you had and you lose it. A few words on the soul. Hmm. We have a soul at times. No one's got it nonstop for keeps. Day after day, year after year, may pass without it. Sometimes it will settle for a while, only in childhood fears or raptures, sometimes only in astonishment that we are old. 
It rarely lends a hand to uphill tasks like moving furniture or lifting luggage or going miles in shoes that pinch. It usually steps out whenever meat needs chopping or forms have to be filled. For every thousand conversations, it participates in one, if even that, since it prefers silence. Just when our body goes from ache to pain, it slips off duty. It's picky. It doesn't like seeing us in crowds or hustling for a dubious advantage and doesn't like creaky machinations that make it sick. Joy and sorrow aren't two different feelings for it. It attends us only when the two are joined. Joy and sorrow aren't two different feelings for it. It attends us only when the two are joined. We can count on it when we're sure of nothing and curious about everything. Among the material objects, it favors clocks with pendulums and mirrors, which keep on working even when no one is looking. It won't say where it comes from or when it's taking off again, though it's clearly expecting such questions. We need it, but apparently it needs us too for some reason. Mm. That's beautiful. Kim, thank you. Like the, Slav the Slava, she the dude. She is. She definitely is. Yeah, really an astonishing the, poet. The Nobel Prize Committee thought so as well. I just want to say one last thing before we, we go about this um, being connected to the land and, and land being um, abused. You know, I moved to Marin County 34 years ago, and there was hardly any French broom. And now it is just everywhere. Invasive species are taken over. And I drive down certain roads, and it's just lined with immigrants who are standing there waiting for someone to give them work right it's like we have a need for removing invasive species we have a huge population looking for work why can't we put these two together why don't we have a, a, a works progress administration that takes people off the street says go in and remove the invasive species and plant native species and we will feed you and clothe you and give you a place to live and a stipend and it would be a fantastic use of resources and money so, Think of the fun they could have with feral hogs in Texas. <laughs> so, you know, there's no shortage of, of, of people who bought it. There's people who love to work the land. I, this is something from Michael Mead, since he was mentioned earlier. Um, you know what the most popular hobby in America is? Like, blows all the other hobbies out of the water. Anybody have any idea what it is? Knitting? Gard gardening. Gardening. There are, there's more money spent on gardens and more Excellent. gardeners than any other anyone else. And Rumi says there's a million ways to kneel and kiss the earth, right? And gardening is one of them. And, you know, people love to, when, when I garden, when I put my hands in the soil, I sometimes have a feeling of I'm doing something that millions of people have done for thousands of years with put, putting my hands in and, and growing something. And it makes me feel connected to something much larger than myself. It's a transcendent experience. And we need more of that. That's that's also an initiation. So anyway, end of rant. I love that. Thank you. And thank you all. It's been fun as usual.